So there's some pretty normal sample size guidelines for each type of design. So if we're looking at classic, quasi-experimental, or pre-experimental designs, we want to look at 10 to 15 individuals for each experimental group and each control group. So we're looking at, if we have an experimental group and a control group, we're looking at 20 to 30 individuals minimum. Um, if we're looking at uh, where we don't have a control group or we're just having an experimental group, we're looking at 10 to 15 people uh, you know, per group. Um, of course, the larger the better as far as validity and stuff goes, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. For survey research designs, right, and that's ex post facto and time lag and all that kind of stuff that we talked about, we want to look at about 35 people for each independent variable under the study. So if we have uh, 10 independent variables, right, we want to look at about 350 people average uh, overall that we need to uh, include in our study. Next, we're going to talk about criteria for choosing a quantitative design and look at integrity of a design. Internal validity, changes due to the program or intervention, really means we want to make sure that our intervention or our uh, treatment is really what's causing or creating the outcome. So is, the, is there no third-party factor that's going to come in and create the outcome or create the fact that there was no outcome? External validity is where findings can be generalized and applied to others beyond the study group. So we want to make sure that our findings can be generalized to a broader audience uh, or the broader population. Sampling generalization is when you assert findings uh, that apply to this sample's population. So when you have good internal validity and external validity, that's when you can really say, this is what I found with my sample, and I think it applies to the population because I had good internal and external validity. There are many threats to internal validity, right? And that's when we want to make sure that or whatever treatment or program or intervention we're running is the real cause or uh, the real meaning behind whatever outcomes we have or findings we get. And there's sort of a lot of threats to that, and we're going to go over these in a little bit more detail. But they're maturation, repeated testing, history, instrumentation, instrumentation, sorry, regression to the mean, experimental mortality, selection bias, and selection bias interaction. So the first one is maturation, and this refers to changes or processes that occur over time with study participants. So as they get older, they may get smarter or wiser, or as they get older, they grow fatigued a little bit quicker. So a good example of this is, was participation in a school year-long after-school arts program, or the development processes responsible for improved fine motor skills of nine-year-olds. So really, was it the fact that they just got a little older, or was it the fact that they participated in a certain class that resulted in the outcome? The next one is experimental mortality, and this is also known as attrition, attrition or dropout rate. So it happens for a variety of reasons, but people drop or quit uh, their participation in a study. So what we will look at is, does the research uh, project skew the results as far as the dropouts? So, you know, you look at changes that happen with the dependent variable. Is that due to the program we we're running or fact that we had enough people drop out and there's going to be a skew of the results? or the results are just wrong because we can't really tell that because of the dropouts uh, were significant. So our final example we're gonna look at is instrumentation. And basically between the pre-testing and post-testing, there's a change in the way the observations were going or the testing was defined or recorded. So we wanna make sure that our testing is consistent from the pre-test and the post-test or any kind of uh, ongoing test within the, the thing, right? 
So the definition of acceptable aerobic activity is changed between the pretest and the post-test. So within that, we're going to look at um, 30, more than 30 minutes at least three times per week to more than 45 minutes at least five times per week. So one of our uh, concepts we operationalized changed in its, in its definition, which is going to skew the results uh, in one fashion or another. So to maximize internal validity, there is a hierarchy of quantitative designs, and you can look at them here. You know, basically, we're looking at if you really want to do some a study, we're going to maximize internal validity. Uh, we're going to look at classic experimental design is the best one to look at. And then all the way down to a one-time post-test design. And then everything in between, right? And you can look at these uh, in a, a number of different ways. But basically, you need to know that there are better ways to design and experiment and rec you know, record information to maximize internal validity. And basically, again, that's saying that what we're recording, the intervention or the treatment, is the real reason for the outcome or the dependent variable changes. There's not some other factor involved uh, or some kind of threat to the internal validity that's present.